All right. Welcome to Roots of Reality Experiences. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Donald Johansson, who is a paleoanthropologist and the chair in human origins at the School of Human Evolution and Social Change at Arizona State University. Additionally, he's the founding director of the Institute of Human Origins and is famous for discovering the hominid skeleton known as Lucy. Lastly, he has also conducted research on human origins around the world and has authored various books on the topic. So, Dr. Johansson, thanks for coming on today. Well, it's a pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. So when did you first get interested in human origins? Well, you know, I was a, a young teenager. Uh, it was, a, I, I, as far as I can tell, I was about 13 years old. And uh, I was the, a neighbor who was an anthropologist. He studied social cultural anthropology, uh, became a good friend and mentor to me. And uh, he uh, knew that my leanings were certainly not in the direction of going and studying other societies or cultures, but I was more interested in the sort of biological basis uh, of what makes us human and uh, how we fit into the biological world. And he presented me with a little thin book called Man's Place in Nature, which was written by Thomas Henry Huxley, who was a a real pal of Charles Darwin's. And uh, this book was uh, revelatory to me. Uh, the, the, the core idea of this book was that humans and African apes shared a common ancestor. Uh, and that common ancestor was probably in Africa. That if we look around at our zoological order, which is called primates, uh, we most close, our, our closest living relatives are chimpanzees. We know that they, from the work of uh, primatologists like Jane Goodall and others, that, you know, they, they have emotions like us, they kind of act like us sometimes, or we act like them. Uh, and, and certainly now with uh, genetics, we know that we're 99% identical. And at that time, Darwin and Huxley felt that the anatomical similarities in teeth and jaws and skeletons and so on were were very per, per, persuasive. And uh, they made the suggestion that eventually uh, a common ancestor to uh, modern day chimps and humans uh, would be discovered in Africa. And uh, my my mentor was working in Africa and came back telling wonderful stories about what he encountered. And I, I, it really resonated with me. You know, it, it was it was something I couldn't stop talking about. And the more things he gave me to read, the more excited I got. But that was really the the, the spark that ignited this fascination with trying to understand um, our place in nature, where we came from, how we got here. I mean, every little kid asked that question, you know, mommy, where sure. did I come from? But uh, in this case, uh, Darwin and Huxley uh, and other people were looking for that fossil evidence that might tie us more closely to the natural world and explain um, how humans got here through Darwin's idea of descent with modification. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, so what was kind of the state of the field when you first got involved, you know, prior to discovering Lucy? How much did we know about human origins? Well, uh, when I sort of officially entered the field, which uh, I say was 1970, I was 27 years old. Uh, and a graduate student at the University of Chicago and had somehow talked my way onto an expedition <laughs> with my, one of my um, advisors, uh, the late Professor Clark Howell, who had an expedition in Southern Ethiopia. Um, we, you know, we had Neanderthals, we had Peking and Java Man or Homo erectus. We had Cro-Magnons, which were essentially us. We had two kinds of Australopithecus in um, Southern Africa. We had Australopithecus species in Eastern Africa, uh, but there weren't many species. Today, there are well over 20 different kinds or species 
of human ancestors on the human family tree. And uh, in 1970, it was uh, the, the, the tree was relatively sparse. So it was uh, very difficult to try to make connections between uh, some of these different species. And uh, what I like to call uh, and did in my first book, uh, the 1970s, uh, the golden age of, of, uh, of paleoanthropology. It was when teams around Lake Turkana under the direction of the late Richard Leakey and his team and our work up in the Afar uh, and uh, elsewhere in the Great Rift Valley really uh, dominated the field of paleoanthropology and, and gave us a very accurate timetable because we were, we, we were able to very accurately date the ages of these fossils uh, at larger samples uh, in well-stratified sequences that were associated with at least some sort of glimpse into the kind of world, the environment in which they lived, and it was a time when uh, paleoanthropology was really bursting at the seams and uh, discoveries were uh, were covered you know incessantly in the press and so on so uh, today we have you know maybe three times the number of species of humans and human ancestors uh, in a more species rich tree uh, and um, we can talk a little bit about the relationships between some of these, but yeah. it's, a, it's a very different landscape today than it was in 1970. Yeah, it's it's amazing how many advancements just continue to pile up over time. And, you know, comparing it from when you first got into the field to today, um, it's crazy how much progress we've made. Uh, it's I mean, the, the hunt for human origins in general. I can only imagine it'd be incredibly exciting for you in the in the seventies to join this because it's uh, something that was still, I suppose, you know, there's lots of mysteries involved, and now we know much more, and there's still many mysteries. But uh, you know, it's just it's kind of like searching for uh, you know planets in space that might have life, kind of you know, trying to find uh, creatures of the past that you know we descend from, or or you know, with uh, you know more recent discoveries, you know, different species uh, of hominids that we overlapped with that were very similar to us you know it's it's really cool yeah, yeah. i mean I, I think that uh there was there still is in some quarters uh a view that there was sort of a, a straight line from a very ape-like ancestor to uh modern humans uh, we see these cartoons over and over. Yeah, of a right. punch over ape and getting more yeah. upright. I mean, Darwin said that was one of the cardinal features of being human was walking on two legs, not four. Uh, we see the brain getting a little bit larger, and uh, there was this uh, this mistaken view that uh, human evolution was linear, that there was something about uh, something inherent in our zoological family that was ultimately going to lead to that white European male. That's all right. Yeah. And uh, what we, what we've learned is uh, that it's much more complex than that. And that it's very much like the original diagram that, uh, that did not attract my attention when I was interested in, got interested at 13 years old. I mean, Huxley's book had pictures of skulls and a Neanderthal skull had been found in 1856. And uh, Darwin's book, The Origin, you know, a volume about like that, had one diagram, which was a black and white hypothetical family tree with a lot of branches. And of course, as we study the evolution of insects, the evolution of mammals, the evolution of any life forms on this planet, we see that it is, they're typified as having many, many branches, just as Darwin had predicted. And it, it was, you know, in certain instances, this branch that was favored uh, and evolved in that direction. And uh, in other species, 
this branch would be favored and natural selection would begin to craft uh, an animal or a plant or an insect or a whatever that was best adapted to that environment. And uh, now we were faced with a richness of species and uh, people began to uh, offer their own kind of um, idea of how they were connected. Uh, when I was a, a graduate student in the late uh, 60s, uh, we thought that uh, humans perhaps came out of Neanderthals in Europe. Uh, today, uh, and, and the Neanderthals were a very different species. We now know that we were actually able to interbreed with Neanderthals, right? You and I yeah. have Neanderthal genes. Yeah, that's right. Our genome. Yeah. And uh, it turns out that uh, the, the Eurocentric view uh, that, of course, these were all European scientists right. looking at it. <laughs> they wanted to be, you know, at the center of it all. And that the Eurocentric view was highly biased. Uh, and also the fact that because we were human, we were so unique that our evolution had to be different from all other species, which it's not. Um, so th there, the, the fluorescence of information that has come to us through discovery, and I, I'm the first one to say that it's not just a discovery-based science, it's what we do with those discoveries that's so important. But you, you've got to have the alpha evidence, which are the fossils themselves, uh, has changed uh, dramatically with with the modern synthesis of evolutionary biology uh, that was articulated in, uh, early on in the 40s. And the field uh, is has become much more rigorous in terms of evaluating these discoveries and the, the fossil storehouses become much richer so that we have an ability to uh, look at different early human ancestors from different parts of the world at different times. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's wonderful to be able to delve into our own past like that. And in later stages, of course, with the emergence of everyone who's watching, Homo sapiens, uh, genetics has played a pretty revolutionary role in helping us understand that final leap, for example. Yeah. Now, I want to talk to you a little bit about discovering Lucy. Can you tell me, Cap, the, it's a brief story about how you first discovered Lucy and what that was like? Yeah, I, I, just, I, don't, I can't imagine how many. I, I would be probably a multimillionaire if I were paid a dollar every time I told this story. But you need uh, a summary version, so you don't have to go into too much. But uh, in uh, 1974, I was participating as a co-leader in an expedition to the the northeastern part of the great Africa's Great Rift Valley, which is called the Afar Triangle, and it's located in Ethiopia and uh, in very rich fossil beds and uh, was out surveying on a Sunday. And it was, you know, one of these brutally hot days. It was just a little afternoon or something like that. And uh, I was, I'm always looking at the ground and uh, happened to notice a little fragment of bone, which was only about that long, but it was clear from all the time I had spent studying and, you know, osteology, the study of bones or, dissecting apes or humans in the in the lab that I knew the anatomy well enough to know that it came you know from this part of the of the arm it's the one that allows us to extend and flex our arm like that it's called the ulna it has a little notch in it and when I bent down to examine it I looked at it and I said well, this is this is not a baboon this is not a, a, a any kind of monkey or antelope gazelle or any kind of animal it, it has the anatomy that's similar to the anatomy that's in my elbow and that this is a what we called hominids in those days we call them hominins these days because of a change in uh, nomenclature but uh, that it was a human ancestor uh, and then 
my graduate student who was with me, Tom Gray, uh, pointed out a couple of other bones that turned out to be uh, shards of a skull. And I looked up a slope and I could see other bones glistening in that sun. And I saw a bit of a, of a leg and a bit of a jaw and, and so on, and realized that th this was part of a skeleton. And I knew that from the geology, from the rock strata that were there, that it was in pre three million year old deposits. We didn't know exactly how old she was. Yeah. Uh, until actually the 1990s, when we got really precise dates, and she died along a late margin at about 3.18 million years ago. But standing there, uh, as I've uh, written about and am writing about now, I'm finishing up my autobiography right now, uh, it was the childhood dream come true. Yeah. <laughs> Here at my feet was that skeleton that paleoanthropologists dream about. Uh, you know, if uh, any paleoanthropologist who tells you that they're not going to be significantly influenced by a significant discovery like this is not telling the truth. I mean, <laughs> this was a moment of uh, a defining moment in my life. I don't think I thought of it at that time as a as a defining moment. I was so overwhelmingly happy and rewarded to have found something like this. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, but it, it certainly defined my career and became a real icon in terms of uh, paleoanthropology. I, all those things didn't unfold at that moment, but as I look back on it and write about it, um, you know, you talk, tell someone on a, on a plane or at a dinner that you're an anthropologist you've worked in ethiopia and you've been looking for for fossils and uh they you know they what did you ever find anything and i say well i'm the guy who actually found lucy and they, they immediately <laughs> you know they they're into it yeah uh, yeah it's the touchstone um and it's it's true that today uh we read in newspapers or magazines or newscasts about in Kenya, a skull older than Lucy was, yeah. you know, yeah. so she became the, the kind of touchstone, the, the benchmark by which uh, all subsequent discoveries uh, were compared. But in that moment, uh, you know, I forgot about the 110 degrees heat and the fact that I all I could think about was driving back to the river and, and jumping in for a swim. Right. Uh, it, it was just a, a highly emotional moment. Uh, and it's in, in the retelling of it, I'm reading right now the final text for my uh, version or edit for my autobiography. And uh, I still get a kick out of reading about it and talking about it. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> I mean, so it sounds like then immediately in that moment when you looked at it, you knew that this was something special. Oh, yes. I mean, you know, we're we're happy when we find a chunk of jaw or a, a bit of a, a skull or something. But here was, you know, there were bits of arms, bits of legs. It was a pelvis, uh, very to, to find a pelvis is very extraordinary because that's, you know, the key area which would, defines our yeah. mode of locomotion. Uh, so uh, I, I knew that the, a lot of information would come out from this discovery. And uh, so I knew it would, would add considerably to our understanding. I didn't know what species it was, of course. Right. It it was uh, the guess was that it was Australopithecus, this tongue twister that Raymond Dart named in 1925. Uh, but there were things about it, uh, the relatively short lower limbs, for example, that were more ape-like. Uh, the uh, the fact that there were certain teeth in her jaws 
in her jaw that were more ape-like. Uh, but it, it really took a number of years before we really totally understood that this belonged to a, a bona fide new species from a new time level, which was pre three million. Uh, and uh, that in my view have plays a very significant role in our understanding of the family tree. Yeah. Yeah. That is fascinating. And uh, thanks for sharing that story. Cause I mean, it does, it, it's such an interesting thing. I mean, to when you're examining a, a fossil like that of um, a species so similar to us, you know, the, it is kind of like the equivalent of someone interacting in some way with, you know, uh, some type of, you know, alien almost in outer space because it's, uh, you know, it, it's so close to us, but also different. You know, did you ever, like, how do you reflect on that being a human being examining fossils of, you know, species that are so similar to us from the past, you know, millions of years old? Well, uh, I don't know when I actually had this thought, but it was, it was sort of as if, well, the one thing that was so important about it was when you could identify it as an individual, as a, as a person, you know, yeah. because there was parts of a skull there was a you know a fairly complete lower jaw yeah this lower jaw and uh some of these teeth for example well, i can't really see them there i guess i can I see it yeah yeah but at any rate there are features of this that are much more ape-like than your jaw or my jaw right uh, but i had a it gives you a sense that there was an individual uh and I, I, I thought this is sort of like she has been, and we think it was a she because of her, she's only three and a half feet tall when she died. And we know she was an adult because uh, if that's in focus, a third molar or wisdom tooth is present. And that means that biologically she was an adult. Yeah. Uh, that it was as if she was in suspended animation for 3.2 million years and yeah some totally anonymous person comes along <laughs> exactly the time that she makes a reappearance because of erosion right uh, and and it's just it you know it's as if she she's back in the world of the living again yeah uh and it's it that evening what was so poignant about the evening and here we are, you know, we're out in the middle of a desert and and uh, you're a long way from anywhere. Uh, but we certainly had a bottle of champagne waiting in camp for something like this. I guess it was warm, but it was there. And um, people were, were, the students, my students and colleagues, you know, are we going back to uh, someone? Uh, someone said, well, you know, how old do you think this individual was when it died and so on? And we were celebrating by listening to a tape recording on my little Sony tape recorder of uh, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band being a big Beatles fan in those yeah. days. Still <laughs> am. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds is playing. And my girlfriend says, hey, why don't you call it Lucy if you think it's a, a, a female? And I thought, oh, boy, you know, I just got my doctorate at the University of Chicago. I mean, I'm, this needs some very scientific name. Right. <laughs> no, it was too late. Uh, how old in the morning at breakfast? Yeah, you know, you think you're going back to the Lucy site today? You think we'll find more of Lucy's skull? Uh, are you sure it's a female? And I'd say, well, from the diminutive size, I'm... I'm I'm pretty certain that it is, and it is one of the smaller members of her species that we've ever found. We now have probably over 500 specimens of her species. Sometimes it's only a single tooth, or partial skeleton, or a skull, or yeah, whatever. But um, the the fact that you could identify this as an individual, I think, was 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 uh, very special that uh, she has has become and continues to be 
Um, one of our ancestors that people talk about the most. Um, if you look at recent discoveries, for example, that are announced, um, almost all, always there's a reference yep. uh, to uh, to the fact that uh, the anatomy didn't look like the new anatomy of the specimen is similar to Lucy's anatomy or whatever. So uh, she had a real impact on uh, really enlarging the average person's interest in the subject of human origins, or as we call it, paleoanthropology. And it also, uh, her species, which was named in 1978, is after the Afar region and people who live there, Australopithecus afarensis, um, has had numerous scientists, two, two generations of, or so, three generations, of, well, good two generations of, of anthropologists applying new methodologies to understanding how we can get even more information out of these ancestors. Yeah. So while she played an important role in, in the average person's view, who, someone who's interested in human origins, but she played a very important role in uh, developing new new approaches, theoretical ideas about our early human ancestors. In fact, the Institute of Human Origins that uh, I founded way back in 1981 and is now at Arizona State University will have a major symposium next, I think it's next April, yes, uh, on the 50th year of yeah. the anniversary of her discovery. Don't ask me where all those years went. But <laughs> Um, it, it's going to focus on, you know, what has been the influence of taking Lucy as the, the, the key point on paleoanthropology. Um, and we talk about Lucy a lot, but with, you know, 500 specimens over some 800,000 years of time uh, gives us a lot of information to work with. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's seems like it's a fossil that would just continue to be re-examined more and more and more as we have more discoveries to to put with it. Um, so for like the average person, you know, listening or watching this, how would you describe where Lucy's species fits in the family tree of of uh, human origins? Well, it's uh, that's a, a very interesting question because. In 78, when I announced her as a new species at a uh, uh, international meeting in Sweden, I also faced that question and gave a, my, uh, what was at that time, uh, my first impression of where I thought she fit on the family tree. And uh, I hypothesized, as did uh, some of my other colleagues, that this was the last species before the split, uh, the major split, one branch led to more species of her genus, Australopithecus, and the other branch led to our own genus, which is Linnaeus called Homo, after the Latin word for man. So we are Homo sapiens, supposedly wise man, but I read the same newspapers you do. Um, but that these two major evolutionary trajectories had very different ways of solving challenges that were presented to them by uh, environmental change. Uh, we know that the species Lucy belongs to died out right after three million years. We know that there was a significant change in environment brought about by uh, much more arid conditions. Uh, we know that there was a stimulus among other mammalian groups like antelopes, uh, other primates, um, and, and different kinds of mammals to, to diversify into different species. And that one branch, one, one branch descending from her, uh, sort of evolved into these very specialized Australopithecus creatures that were uh, really... Uh, very, they were bona fide vegetarians. 
And they were living on a very low energy environment that demanded that, that they have significant enlargement of their whole masticatory system. Um, the other branch uh, began to change in other directions and uh, we're beginning to see the appearance of stone tools associated with the earliest uh, genus uh, or earliest species of Homo. So their method uh, of adapting and ch to these challenges was was quite different behaviorally. They were, you know, this was the dawn of, of human culture. Um, and that's that's the, the the presentation I made. And I've just uh, just returned. Here we are. We're at the beginning of, of uh, July. But uh, just a month ago, I was in Paris at an international symposium at the Collège de France, where um, one of our postdocs gave a very major and fascinating paper, uh, Ethiopian scholar. You know, one of, one of the great rewards of working in Ethiopia over the years is seeing that when we first started there, there, there weren't any Ethiopian scholars. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, there, there weren't any facilities. And the various teams, including our teams from the Institute, um, worked hard to, you know, assist in the developing of manpower, which is very important. The yes. Institute of Human Origins today is uh, the new director is uh, Johannes Haile Selassie, who was born and, and raised in Ethiopia. That's great. What's that? That's great. That uh, it's becoming more of a global globalized profession. Oh. Everyone wants to be a part of it because it's the human story. So you should get everyone from around the globe, all the talent. So, you know, it's sort of like if you were a, a Southwestern archaeologist or Midwestern archaeologist in the United States, you wouldn't want someone from France or Germany or Italy coming over and excavating everything <laughs> and yeah. keeping all the rest of us ignorant, you know? Right. So uh, that's been one of the great rewards. But this young man, uh, is a professor now at the University of Chicago, and he gave a paper on the state of Australopithecus. You know, uh, what do we think today? Uh, almost, you know, 40 some years later. And uh, he presented a couple of interesting things. I did, I certainly don't agree with all of them. One of them is that. Uh, Lucy's species goes back to about 4.2 million. I think hmm. that the species before her is sufficiently different that it belongs in a different species. Okay. But he's, he agreed with the idea that Lucy's species was probably the last um, common ancestor to these two major branches. Wow. One that evolved yeah. into Australopithecus species and died out, and one that gave rise to creatures that were beginning to develop larger brains, uh, rudimentary technology, and through a series of of uh, twists and turns on the family tree, uh, evolved into present day Homo sapiens. So um, that's been for me one of the rewards of finding something young in my career. Yeah, you know, I was twenty one years old, and yeah. <laughs> uh, you know it just takes one ugly fact to destroy a long held theory. That's true. Yeah. But, uh, you know, if somebody found uh, homo fossils pre-Lucy, it would mean that, uh-oh, <laughs> it's a dead end. Yeah. Uh, so that's the working hypothesis at the moment, that she's important because her species was widespread in Eastern Africa, in Ethiopia, Kenya, and Tanzania. Probably in North Central Africa, there's one jaw in Chad. Uh and uh, that uh, that's our working hypothesis at the moment. Yeah, that's really amazing um, to think then, you know, throughout your career, I guess, kind of wondering if, if something might change through, through uh, uh, more fossils being discovered, but it stood the test of time, which is very hard in the sciences and uh, fields like paleoanthropology. So that's pretty amazing. <laughs> It, it is uh, in many ways. Uh, I think the, the press makes it a little more confrontational than it is. Yeah. Uh, 
it is uh, controversial. It is, uh, uh, it, it, there is some level of competition, you know, I mean, sure. uh, I, I know that people who win Nobel prizes are jealous of the lab down the street. Yeah. You know, they got <laughs> yeah. it and they didn't. Yeah. Uh, that's only human, I think, but, um, the reward has been that uh, with more emphasis on not only field work, but also the theoretical world in which we work uh, has, has added immensely to our understanding. And uh, as I alluded to earlier, genetics has been such an incredible, uh, you know, paleo genomics, uh, yeah. uh, and and he did get a Nobel Prize, uh, Svante Pabo, who's a, a a colleague and a friend of mine, uh, and I'll be seeing him uh, next spring for a conference and again in Sweden. But uh, the fact that uh, some of the predictions uh, that were made long before, I mean, Darwin didn't know anything about DNA, right? Uh, he used his he went to the zoo and said, boy, they look a lot like us and we look a lot like them. And he and I could see Darwin and Huxley, you know, sitting out in Kent, having tea in the afternoon, talking about this and making these predictions. And then, you know, the discovery in 1924 by Dart of the first human fossil in Africa that uh, sort of vindicated their predictions. And... Um, Changes have come largely through um, the way uh, discovery and how we analyze these fossils. Are there any discoveries that have been found due to things like, you know, you mentioned genetics, which has obviously become huge today, but are there any discoveries that have occurred in paleoanthropology that surprised you or that was something that you never would have guessed when you first uh, got into the field? Yeah, I, I mean, I, uh, you know, by the time I got into the field, uh, Piltdown, of course, had been debunked as a yeah, <laughs> yeah. You right. Know, I, I think that uh, as as I talk about my classes and my online course, uh, you know, Neanderthals were the first found in 1856. The first fossil human to be found was found in Germany, but. Uh, certainly the French weren't too happy about being descended from the Germans, uh, but they were happy when they got Cro-Magnon man and the British were all sitting across the channel saying, Hey, what about us? Because they of course believed that the Englishman was the pinnacle of, of, uh, of evolution. So they, uh, someone decided to see if they could fool them and, developed this fraud Piltdown and they were ready to take it because, and there was a book written called the first Englishman, interestingly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, of course that, that, that's not exactly what you asked about. I think what really uh, surprised me and many others was the discovery of uh, these fossils called hobbits in uh, Indonesia. Yeah. Uh, and uh, they are uh, an interesting uh, dilemma because uh, they go back, uh, you know, at least 100,000 or more years. They're only, they're Lucy sized. Uh, they've got small brains like Lucy. They got really strange, big, almost clown like feet, you know. Um, and there are some rudimentary tools and obviously they were hunting. Um, and yet they, they were, you know, how, how did they get there? When did they get there? Did they, you know, did a, I'm, I'm sure that Australopithecus didn't get out of Africa, but maybe they did. Uh, and some people thought, well, this can't be right to have a, 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 a hominin ancestor at a hundred thousand years or so with such small stature and such a tiny brain, there's something wrong here. Um, and it was difficult. That was a surprise. Nobody ever expected that. 
But in uh, shortly after it was announced, I gave a, uh, a seminar uh, when I was at the university. And I said, well, think about this for a second, because it looks like it's real. I mean, people have seen it. You know, it's a fossil. It's not made up of pieces of different individuals. It's well dated. It was excavated. Um, so if you if you go to Madagascar, where you, you have lemurs, and you only have lemurs on Madagascar, you don't have them anywhere else in the world, uh, you think of lemurs as, you know, maybe a, a ringtail lemur is, you know, kind of dog-sized, large dog-sized or something, or smaller than the Great Dane, but um and uh they have little ones that fit in your hand um and uh, lo and behold people have found lemurs the size of female gorillas that died out when humans got to madagascar and killed and ate, ate them so i said you know we we've got to try to explain how in the world this happened because this is a real thing and some of the ideas that, that came out were that these were, you know, microcephalics and they were medical anomalies and so on. It doesn't seem to be the case. They don't, that, that they don't look like that. They don't look like anomalies. Uh, probably island dwarfing had something to do with it. We know that when larger animals like elephants get isolated on islands, that there's selection for smaller body size because there's a lot of competition for very restricted amount of resources. So that was one that caught us all off guard. Um, and uh, there have been a number of uh, discoveries in South Africa that uh, of, of recent that I, I wouldn't say that they've re really unanticipated, uh, but they have, and I, and I think that my, particular view is that South Africa, if you look at a map of Africa, uh, South Africa is a cul-de-sac. Uh, and the only thing beyond that is Antarctica. And I think that animals, humans, human ancestors, did migrate down to South Africa and became pretty much reproductively isolated there from what was going on in East Africa. And we see that they've evolved into things like Homo naledi and uh, Australopithecus sediba, Australopithecus africanus, Australopithecus robustus. And we never find those in East Africa. And we never find the East African species in South Africa. So it shows the inventiveness of natural selection and that it wasn't the straight line that I talked about, that it was branching. And I think that uh, these fossils are important that are being found in South Africa, not because they're ancestors to us, but because they show that there were probably many attempts, not conscious of course, but many attempts at um, becoming a more advanced hominid uh, that uh, never made it. Yeah, I mean, it is really interesting because it seems like over the years they've added you know, more and more potential species that could have overlapped with our own species, Homo sapiens, um, at, at different points in time. I mean, you mentioned Neanderthals, um, you know, interbreeding with with Homo sapiens, and I've heard people talk about like another species, Denisovans, might have interbred with with people. Um, then the, the Hobbit species. Is it does it surprise you how many species may have existed with our ancestors at one point in time that are you know so similar but different? Yeah. I, I... It, it doesn't surprise me, uh, but uh, we have, you know, many different species of monkeys that exist at the same time. We have different species of apes, like we have bonobos, which are a different species, yep. uh, uh, pan paniscus, we have pan troglodytes, and we have uh, probably two species of gorilla that exist. So uh, it's not unusual that the question is, um, you know, why was it that we were are the only survivors? Yes, uh, yeah. Which is even a, a more interesting question. But uh, talking about genetics, uh, 
Denisovans, which are found in the Altai Plateau in Siberia, um, were found through genetics. You know, they found a little finger. A finger, that's right, yeah. <laughs> a, a pinky finger and sent it to Svante Pabo's lab in Leipzig, Germany. And uh, they looked at it and it wasn't Homo sapiens and it wasn't Neanderthal. And it was something new. And uh, <laughs> we now know that the, there's something they call Denny, uh, which is a, a, f a first generation offspring of a Neanderthal uh, Denisovan combination. So they were able to interbreed. And um, it, so it, it, it bef as I said before, it looked like a straight line. Now it, it looks like there were a number of species, you know, uh, things like Robustus and, and Sediba and Afarensis and uh, other species that may have overlapped over time. And I think that the, the generally these populations uh, were, were uh, isolated in different regions. And that one of the core ideas in the origin, uh, Darwin's origin is that uh, there will be different selective forces on different, if, in different areas on similar species that will begin to evolve into different species. And uh, I, I think that we'll, we'll probably always underestimate the number of species. Um, I, it's not that I'm what are sometimes called a splitter and every new bone that's found gets a new species. But if you, if you, you look at a closely related uh, species of, of, of rodents or of uh, lemurs are a good example, and all you have are the bones, you don't know what their what their pelage color was. You don't know what their reproductive, uh, you know, uh, dances were or their calls were like. Uh, but ha going out to to Madagascar, you see many different species. You see how distinctly different diets, uh, different colorations, and so on. So I think it's it's not surprising that there were different species of humans in the past, but ultimately that bushy tree was was sort of winnowed down to us who are the, the most dominant species on the planet. Yeah, I mean, I always thought it was kind of humbling, uh, you know, as they come out with new species that of humans that had existed at the same time as uh, our ancestors did long and long ago, just to think that, because I think for, for many people and people obviously still today, for the most part, you know, not many people are thinking nor even necessarily know that, uh, you know, they're in their DNA is more than just homo sapien, for example. Um, you know, that's not something people really process very well or, or have ever been thought about, but it just just show how complex our story is. And, um, you know, that it, it really is pretty amazing, all the different aspects to, you know, how we came here today uh, in regard to all the different human species that were around us. So pretty, pretty cool. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it, you know, it, it leads uh, to a, a, a com another, you know, common question that I'm asked uh, so often is, uh, are we going to evolve into another species? Um, and at the moment, uh, genes are being exchanged all over the globe. And uh, do, two million years ago, even a hundred thousand years ago, I mean, you didn't get on an airplane and fly from Germany to Australia and exchange genes. No, they were isolated down there for fifty thousand years. Uh, or other places where they were uh, isolated for longer periods, like uh, even the distance between Eastern and Southern Africa, they were isolated for long enough periods that they evolved into different species. But as soon as we exchanged genes globally, uh, we keep the species sort of similar everywhere. 
and it doesn't speciate or evolve into another species. I suppose that, you know, the science fiction writer would say, well, you, we send something out into space and it goes out there and they're away for a million years. We all think a million years is, you know, and then what do we just see new galaxies at how many billions of years? I mean, it's uh, it's incredible, but if, if they went out uh, and were successful and were separated for half a million or a million years and came back to Earth, maybe they would be a new species because of living in a very different environment and having started with a certain gene mix and had different kinds of mutations and so forth and so on. But uh, I don't think we're going to see our own species speciate on this planet. Yeah, that that makes sense, and uh, I suppose any any changes that would happen to our species would be kind of stuff we do to ourselves, you know, with technology or something like that, uh, yeah. exponentially increasing more and more over time. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess the sort of more natural aspect of of evolving is a little bit limited right now. Um, but yeah, it's it's pretty pretty interesting, um, especially I think people are becoming more aware of sort of the, the global element of, of being a human being, given all the DNA tests going on with like ancestry companies and people are getting interested in that. And, you know, it wasn't that long ago that National Geographic had the genographic project that was, you know, doing DNA testing and including like Neanderthal DNA results and uh, Denisovan, um, oh. getting people kind of inspired by the complexity of their origin stories. So yeah, I, I, I think that's very, uh, it, it's enlightening to know that uh, we are united by our genetic heritage. Uh, that, um, and the, 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 some of the populations with the highest level of variation in their genomes are in Africa, where they've been evolving the longest. So uh, it, it, it's, it's beginning to, to I think, be very important to understand that we're really united by our past, uh, that, that we should, the differences we see in uh, eye color or uh, eye shape or color of skin or whatever are really very minor differences. That the core of our, what makes us who we are, our genomes um, is, uh, is pretty similar worldwide that uh, Richard Lewinton, I think, uh, late Richard Lewinton, a geneticist who was at Harvard, who was at Chicago when I was a graduate student, said that the differences between two chimpanzees in a troop are much larger than the differences between two populations widely spread across the planet because they've been evolving much longer uh, than we have. So uh, genetics is something that, that I would hope help break down these superficial barriers of, of, uh, that tend to separate people. Yeah, you would hope. Um, and I mean, it seems like our world is not, especially with you know, the internet, for example, we're not drifting apart uh, anytime soon. We seem to be just getting more and more uh, kind of wrapped up with each other, no matter where we are today, uh, thanks to the internet. Um, so yeah, that isolation, I guess, that could create sort of a different evolutionary path isn't isn't happening right now with our species, it seems. Um, perhaps, I mean, I guess even, even like isolated tribes are becoming less isolated over time um, around the world. So I'm not sure what their genetics would look like uh, on a DNA test compared to others, but it's pretty hard to be isolated in the 21st century. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, people say, you know, why do Scandinavians look like Scandinavians? Well, because Scandinavians marry Scandinavians. You know, uh, I suppose you could you could postulate that uh, because there is so much gene flow happening on the planet because it's easy to get anywhere. And people are getting everywhere and uh, that there will be maybe a, re a reduction in some of the features that we tend to 
point to as separating us into the, this terrible word races will begin to disappear. Yeah, I mean, you would think so. I, I would, and you would hope because it seems like you know throughout history, different societies have changed because of different migration patterns or you know different uh, invasions over time, military wise. I mean, we've constantly been moving around and mixing with each other. Uh, we've kind of settled into different ethnic groups right now, but what that ethnicity means hundreds and hundreds of years from now, as it's more intermixed with others, uh, could be totally something different. So, um, and hopefully, it's more just a human, a human species thing instead of a, a human ethnicity. So, um, so thinking uh, big picture, then for the future, you know, are there any, do you have any like predictions of what we may discover about human origins in the future or something that you think we may be on the verge of discovering? Well, uh, when I was very active in the seventies and traveling to Africa uh, every year on expeditions, and uh, I would get calls from reporters and, you know, they say, what do you expect to find? And I would basically say, the unexpected, uh, because, uh, and and it, it's true. I mean, I don't think that Mary Leakey, the late Mary Leakey, uh, when she came and visited our camp in uh, 1974 uh, with her son, Richard, they flew up from Kenya, uh, her mind got excited because she saw these fossils that were more than three million years old that we were finding. We knew that they were older than that. We didn't know it was a new species. It was pre-Lucy. Uh, the, the serendipity of life is, you know, they came on like a Thursday and were there Friday and left on Saturday. And Sunday I went out and found Lucy, you know, the day after they left. <laughs> Naturally. But it, it her visit uh, actually stimulated her to go back to a site that she and her uh, late husband, L Louis Leakey, had visited in 1939, I think, which is called Lytoli. And uh, no one knew that she was going to find footprints, of, of fossilized footprints of humans, uh, in fact, of Lucy's species uh, in a volcanic ash. So I, I think that um, I think that the where we're going to find some very interesting uh, developments uh, include one uh, our own species uh, sapiens. Uh, we certainly by around two hundred thousand years, uh, definitely by one hundred sixty thousand years ago. Uh, there are there are specimens of skulls that are no different from yours and mine. Okay? Uh, whether or not they had symbolic language like we do, that's a cultural side that we'll never know because there's no recordings, but they were making somewhat more sophisticated tools. But from an anatomical point of view, if taking that skull and comparing it, it's like yours and mine. Like, all sapiens today. Uh, and there is suggestions that uh, from Morocco, a French colleague of mine, uh, Jean-Jacques Moulin, has, uh, believes that Homo sapiens goes back as far as 300,000 years in Morocco at uh, Jebel Air Hood. Um, it, that's not I identical to our skulls. Uh, whether it's a species difference or subspecies difference, you know, I don't think it's a species difference, but exactly what it is, it, it's not exactly like who we are today. Um, I don't know if we'll ever be able to pinpoint the spot where sapiens occurred, except by finding a skull that's there and it's the oldest, but maybe it's not the first occurrence. Um, and I think that uh, as people have hypothesized recently that there were probably two major trends of sapiens in Africa that came together and ultimately gave rise to who we are. Uh, so I think that uh, 
the origins of our own species, Homo sapiens, which is clearly African. Uh, that's one one level of assurance we have that we can rule out that it was not Europe or Asia, that it was Africa. Um, precisely where in Africa, I don't know, but I, I would think we'll learn more about the kinds of environment that they lived in, uh, the kinds of technology that they had, uh, perhaps the kinds of diets that they had. Um, and it seems to me that there's an increasing interest in understanding that final leap that made us who we are. Uh, and the other area I think that is, uh, is going to deliver very interesting um, ideas and evidence is the origins of our own genus. Because here you had Australopithecus, uh, they call them ape men in South Africa, but, you know, they're much smaller brained. They're like Lucy's brain, you know. Uh, Lucy's species, by the way, her brain average for her species is, is about 20% larger than that of average chip. So there's already some enlargement there. What that means, I don't know. We can speculate. But, um, you know, where is that connection between Lucy species and Australopithecus and a new genus, Homo. Uh, at the Institute, Kay Reed, who is uh, one of our scholars, has been working in a place north uh, east of where uh, Lucy was found in the Afar. Uh, and her team uh, discovered uh, half a jaw. And it's a, it's a fascinating jaw. Um, there are lots of details to go into, but basically the front of the jaw looks very much like Lucy species, but the back of the jaw indicates that there are already significant changes that look like Homo. So uh, the, the push is on and people want to go to that very important slice of time between uh, two and a half and three million, because that's when our genus first arrived. And, you know, what does it mean that that's when brains began to enlarge? Well, it means that they had probably more sophisticated cognitive abilities. Uh, whether that showed itself in, in tool making or uh, early food processing or what. But uh, I, I, th I think that those are, are two major areas uh, that are going to deliver uh, some enlightenment about transitions to modern sapiens and transitions from Australopithecus to the genus Homo. Um, there are, uh, you know, pre-Lucy species is uh, still being worked out. Uh, there is this one, uh, you know, very fairly complete, nice skeleton from. Um, the central Afar region, which is called Arti, Arti Pithecus, uh, but it's got a divergent great toe like that. You know, it's got a, a tree climbing foot, uh, uh, but it's got a reduction of ape sized canines and so on. But uh, there's been a lot of pushback, and there was at this conference in Paris uh, just two weeks ago uh, a view that this may not be the ancestor, it may be evolved into a side branch. So that, I, I think pre-4 million is going to uh, be very enlightening to us also, um, to see if we can identify the, the, a species that is, we know that the ancestor species for Lucy's species is something called Anamensis, which is between 3.8 and 4.2 million, uh, found around Lake Turkana and also now in the Afar region. But uh, is 200,000 years enough to change an Artipithecus, very ape-like creature into a terrestrial bipedal creature like Anamensis? So 
you know, the, these these are fascinating arguments for us. And sure. Don't, don't <laughs> capture much of the, the public's attention, but, uh, you know, it's a work in progress. And I think that, that science, that's, that's one of the, uh, an aspect of, of this science is that it, 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 it still is at a, at a young stage. Um, it's a lot, we're a lot better off than we were in 1924 and a lot better off than we were in 1970. Uh, but there are still some really outlying questions. You know, will we ever find the common ancestor to apes and humans? Don't know. If they lived in forests and there wasn't good opportunities to become fossilized, uh, maybe we never will. Um, but uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a science that uh, continues to captivate me and my attention. I, you know, find all of these new discoveries that come out so fascinating and interesting and, and, um, and add a little bit here and a little bit there. Yeah, I mean, I imagine that more things will continue to be uncovered with just the technology that we now have at our disposal and um, hopefully the story gets clearer and clearer, but yeah, boy, it sure is exciting to just imagine, you know, how far we've come uh, from, you know, the beginning of your career to today. It's pretty remarkable. So, <laughs> yeah, it, uh, uh, I was at a dinner party and uh, we were picking around these various topics, and some of which we're talking about. And I said, I just feel so fortunate to have gotten into the field when I was, you know, 27 years old in Africa, been able to be part of that, be able to uh, contribute to that and to see how things are changing uh, over time with new discoveries. And uh, I, I, as, a, as, a, as a scientist, you always have to be open to uh, changes and, uh, and in your own ideas. Uh, and uh, I mean, I think about Piltdown and Sir Arthur Keith, who one of the three people who was knighted for what they wrote about Piltdown. Uh, and he he made his entire reputation on Eoanthropus Dawsoni, they called it, the dawn man of, Dar of Dawson, who had made the initial discovery on his property in the countryside. But uh, when it was debunked in the early 1950s and proven to be a combination of an orangutan jaw and a human skull, uh, two scholars had to go out to his retirement cottage and say, you know, this was really a fraud. And, and Surprise. <laughs> I guess he said something like, well, it's going to take me some time to get accustomed to this change in view. <laughs> Like yep, I guess that's life. <laughs> yeah, well, that's science, and yep. uh, um, and as I said, it's not simply discovery driven. I mean, many of our many of our students will may never find a fossil in their lives, uh, but there are people still out there. We have uh, three teams out of uh, IHO working in Ethiopia. Uh, there are teams working on, in Kenya, uh, teams working in South Africa, and uh, there's going to be a lot of discoveries that are going to need simple, simply careful study and uh, comparison and to see how and where they fit into the, the as you said earlier, the broader, bigger picture of uh, how we became human. Yeah, it should be an exciting process. So keep keep on the lookout for what's new in the future. Now, you said you're working on autobiography. Is there anything else you're working on, or you know, what else are you up to these days? Uh, well, I'm uh, I teach a course online for uh, Arizona State University, appropriately called Human Origins, and uh, I've just uh, updated that course. Um, it needed updating with more recent discoveries. Uh, so I've, uh, I've been working on that. Uh, and 
uh, I just get, just became 80 years old last week. So <laughs> happy birthday. <laughs> adjusting to that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and um, so I, I'm still on the faculty. I don't have any graduate students anymore, but uh, going to professional meetings and giving papers and sitting and listening to others and uh, trying to finish this autobiography. Yeah, that sounds great. And uh, yeah, I guess the best way for people to keep track of what you're doing is just uh, following your uh, your bio at Arizona State then and just checking up to see when that autobiography comes out. So. Yeah, the we have a a a, a, a pr web presence in terms of uh, IHO at ASU, and uh, it it talks about the twenty people we have on staff and the the scientists and uh, what they're doing, where they're going, um, what their discoveries are. Uh, we recently uh, my uh, old friend Jane Goodall has donated her archives to the Institute. So we wow. have her archives at, at IHO. Uh, she was there recently visiting to see them, where they were stored and so on. Uh, we've expanded in terms of uh, great ape studies. We have two people, uh, two scholars studying uh, chimpanzees in the wild. Uh, and um, an archaeologist in working in South Africa, looking for the uh, indications of early human uh, modernity or modernness uh, in sites that are 150,000 years old in caves excavating. So there, there's a lot of information there. And we will be launching in uh, another thing that uh, I'm working on uh, is a, a entirely new website. We have a website called Becoming Human, which won a Webby uh, when it, uh, in in the late '90s. But uh, we have a we're, we've been working now for quite a while on a much more expanded, very comprehensive uh, website. Uh, we have Ask an Anthropologist if people send in questions. So um, that's you know, working on all those sorts of things. Yeah, sounds like there's plenty of uh, resources then for people to, to learn more and uh, especially explore the field and your work. So that's awesome. Yeah, and I've, um, I don't do this very often, uh, but I have over the last four or five years uh, yearly um, actually hosted people on safari in Africa and taken them to uh, places uh, where uh, fossils are or were discovered, like uh, Olduvai Gorge. In May, I was at uh, Olduvai with uh, a group of 16 people who have real interest in this field, and only read about it, but never seen what a site looks like, um, and lectured you know, intermittently on those trips. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know how to not be busy. Well, that's good. I think I think that's important. Uh, you always have to have something to do. And it uh, sounds like you're doing a good job of finding things to do. Uh, a lot of people might just get bored at some point in their lives. But yeah, you continue. That's awesome. So, well, yeah, I appreciate your opportunity to. to uh... Oh, it, pleasure is all mine. I mean, to be able to talk to you about uh, human origins, which has been a long interest of my own and. Um, it's such a, a such an important field for just understanding, you know, what it means to be human in the first place and, and trying to reflect on our own lives that, uh, yeah, I, I wish more people uh, were, were getting more interested in this story. And I think over time, more and more have. So we'll continue the progress, I suppose. But yeah, thank you so much for coming on. Well, it's been a pleasure. And uh, who knows, maybe we'll meet again when the autobiography comes out or Yes. Whatever. Uh, congratulations to you on your uh, fairly widely watched interview. <laughs> and um, thanks for having me on.
Yeah, thank you.